please welcome Marco Arment. All right. So this is, uh, this is kind of my therapy session with myself, which uh, conference talks in front of hundreds of people are the perfect venue for that. So I'm mostly known for Instapaper. Instapaper was the first read later service of its kind. And I ran it for about five years, something like that. Um, but it was always under a tremendous amount of stress and fear. So part of it's just the stress of running any large web service. This is one of Tumblr's major outages uh, from 2009. That, uh, you know, when you, when you hit an error page on a web service as a, as a user or a customer, it's kind of annoying, it's kind of frustrating. So imagine the stress of knowing that you're serving thousands of error pages per second for every second you don't fix this. And it's, uh, it, it can be a little stressful. So Instapaper wasn't quite as hard as running Tumblr, but it was the same level of, or the same kinds of stress of just running a service at all that you're knowing that if you mess something up, uh, you're gonna annoy a lot of people. And then the problem Instapaper solved, one of the problems is parsing all that text from articles and making a nice pretty text view. Now the problem is web page coders are crazy and <laughs> this is horrible. This is from Cora. <laughs> Um, one of the problems is that HTML semantics don't mean anything in practice, and the other problem is that as time goes on, people are building pages more in JavaScript and having all these dynamic things that are built, so if you just fetch the page, you don't get any of that. So the, the problem of creating the text view is only always getting harder, and you have to do this for every website. If any website fails, it's your problem, it's not theirs. But I was most afraid of what could happen to the iOS app. Because for Instapaper's first few years, uh, most of its life, really, um, the iOS app was the vast majority of the income. If the app were to ever be pulled from the store, the business would not survive. So any update to the app would have to go through Apple's approval process. Every feature that I would add, everything I would change, would have to go through this. And there was always the possibility that anything I did would be rejected. Here's what that looks like. Application submission feedback. Yeah, they're, they're not very direct there. But um, this is what it looks like, and it's just, you could work on something for months, and they'll just say, nope, and you don't know why. They can reject anything for any reason, including no reason at all. And uh, there's no guarantee they'll approve anything. And then they can change the rules. This is some of the rules. I don't think I'm allowed to share them because I think they're behind some kind of NDA, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> This, it's, this is stupid. So these rules are always changing. So you could have an app that's perfectly fine in the store today, and tomorrow they might have added a rule because something was abused or they were getting a little bit inconvenienced by something developers were doing. They could add a rule at any time that bans an important feature of your app or possibly your entire business. And then there's uh, these guys, patent trolls. These are fun. <laughs> yeah, you guys are you guys are my people. <laughs> patent trolls smelled money in the iOS app ecosystem, so they started attacking independent developers for using things that were common sense and widespread and totally unavoidable. Uh, the patent office is supposed to prevent patents like that from getting through. In practice, they don't, they can't, they never will, and the patent system will always, always be broken. <laughs> and whatever they're supposed to do to protect innovation is a load of crap, and it's just a tax on people who try to build things and try to create. My biggest fear when running a software business is not the boogeyman, horror movies, suspiciously happy people from Utah. My biggest fear is this. Because when you get an overnight document envelope that requires a signature from FedEx, it came from a lawyer. And I, I do occasionally get these for innocuous reasons, like bank things and stuff. Like I get like two a year, but every time I get one of these, my stomach sinks, I'm like, oh God, it's over. That's it, I'm done. So. 
Instapaper was a little bit stressful. I have all these fears about what might happen to it. And one of my biggest fears was competition. Every day, this is, this is totally true, it's kind of embarrassing, I bet I'm not the only one though. Every day I would wake up and before my eyes were even fully focused and adjusted, I would take my phone off the nightstand and open up my email and my feed reader to see if something had come out the night before or overnight that just blew me away, just crushed my business. Some new competitor would come out, maybe a big company would enter the space and just do something I could never match. Uh, every morning I would wake up and, and check for that, which has gotta be unhealthy. And for a while I was unchallenged, but then these guys came by, and it wasn't that bad, but I didn't really take it that well, um, or at least that, not that gracefully. Um, I was always afraid that if I took any risks at all with any features I developed, or if I like slowed down at all, uh, they were gonna just crush me, they were gonna steamroll right over me. They both had big staffs, more money, uh, and every time I worked on a new feature, I was afraid that they would get there first, and that would, you know, they would either beat me to it, or I would release it, and they would copy it a week later, and I was, I always thought that would diminish mine, which is probably immature and wrong, but that's, that was a fear of mine. But then, that happened, and it, save for later became a feature of everything. Uh, Instapaper went from competing with you know, two teams of 10 people to competing with Apple, my own platform that I relied on. Uh, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and almost every major site, New York Times, major publishers built this into their own sites. And the, the weird balloon things. In fact, um, I think I counted five of these actually wanted me to shut down Instapaper and come work for them to build the thing they shut me down for. Um, but that didn't work out. So, uh, <laughs> I was the smallest company in the business pretty quickly. The funny thing about all that competition though, is that it really didn't matter as much as I was afraid that it would, and as much as I thought it did at the time. My success and failure had everything to do with what I was doing to my product. It didn't really have that much to do with what my competitors were doing. My sales would always increase every time I released a major update or a new feature but my sales would never decrease when my competitors did. Almost none of my customers even ever looked at the competition until I started slowing down and getting burnt out on development. It was really entirely up to me. And in fact, this is a pretty common pattern in our industry that a lot of people ignore or don't believe. But all these companies, that's 90s Apple, close enough, uh, all these companies failed or are about to fail uh, for that exact reason. It's not because competition came in and crushed them, it's because they stopped executing well on their own product lines, on their own ideas. Competition has some influence, but really, if all these companies would have just kept doing what they were good at and what their customers liked, they would have been fine for much longer, possibly indefinitely. And in fact, Microsoft is actually in the same position today with Windows 8. Um, so that's worth thinking about, Microsoft. <laughs> Um, but really what competition is a discussion of is market share. Um, you know, the reality is though, that if you have enough people to sustain your business, it doesn't really matter what percentage of the market that is. Markets are huge, the world is a massive place. My share as a percentage really didn't matter. All I needed to do was say, am I still in business? Am I doing okay? Yes or no? So you don't really need everybody to like you. You just need a very small fraction. And that's not easy to get. The world's, again, a big place. You know, everyone's always like, oh, you can get 1% of the market and be set. That's true, that's hard, but, you know, it's a lot easier than getting 60% of the market. And choosing your product doesn't necessarily need to be exclusive. There's a lot of markets for which people don't need to just pick you and hate everyone else. There's a lot of things, especially in content, uh, where their competition is additive and uh, not zero sum. So, I tried to apply these lessons to the magazine. The magazine, I built mostly out of fear, and I wanted income diversification. Instapaper was always so threatened, in my head at least, uh, that I wanted more than one income stream, which should tell you, that's a whole separate talk about job security and what that actually means. 
<laughs> and when you're working for somebody else, how much job security you actually have. Um, <laughs> I don't have time for that today. Um, so I built this. It seemed like the perfect business for what I could do. It, it was a simple, clean, text-focused newsstand magazine, and nothing else looked like this at the time. It was, I really enjoyed designing this and, and building it. And this is one of those areas where competition is not zero sum, and so I figured I'd be fine. No competition, and if they come, who cares? Well, they did. And it still bothered me. And I was, I had to ask myself, why am I so bothered that my category became crowded? What is it about that that I'm uneasy with? And I think I finally figured it out, which I'm gonna reveal here today uh, because you're my therapy session. It's not just about wanting to win or wanting to be, wanting to have the market all to myself. It's rather that I have an inherent distaste for doing what everyone else is doing often to a fault, actually. When a field starts getting very crowded, my instinct is to step out of it. Uh, it's one of my biggest personal weaknesses, so I'm challenging myself with my next project to fix that, which I'll get to in a minute. Most of my fears and my stresses about competition in the past were that I started in an empty category, pretty much, and I was afraid, what happens when this gets crowded? Um, well, I'm, I don't like doing the same thing over and over again. That's boring. Life is short. So uh, I'm going to face those fears, too. I'm going to enter a very crowded market. Now, this is my favorite article I've ever published in the magazine. It's by Scott Simpson. It, it deserves that. It's really good. Um, typical of Scott, it's like half jokey, but genius, and 100% spot on. And uh, it's, it's basically a critique of some of our extremely crowded interests as a culture. And I really fall into a lot of them. This article was kind of a slap in the face in the best possible way. <laughs> you know, half the people I know, uh, probably most of you, uh, you have an SLR, uh, you like fussy coffee or craft beer, and uh, you probably enjoy tweeting and Instagramming from your iPhone. Um, it, it, not a lot of diversity there, not as much as, as you would think. You know, it's easy to be the only coffee snob that you know in real life. Well, maybe not here. <laughs> everywhere else, for normal people, normals, uh, everywhere else, it's easy to be the, you know, like the only one of something, you know, the, the only person with a certain interest. But on the internet, with its connections and people in the air, you, it's really impossible to avoid a crowded field because you're competing with the whole world, everyone who likes fancy coffee is right there in the same place as you. And so every field feels crowded. So I had to get over this fear of being in a crowded space. And I had to ask myself, how can I be satisfied and be you know, at peace with that? So rather than avoiding the crowds and stepping out of them, I, I decided to just ask myself, am I really adding anything here? I don't need to be the only one, I just don't want my efforts to be completely redundant. So, for instance, I used to do an extensive review of every Kindle that came out, because there weren't a lot of people who weren't just, like, you know, the gadget blogs would do theirs, and they would compare it to some, you know, Android tablet that had nothing to do with e-reading, and it, they were mostly being done by people who didn't really use e-readers on a regular basis. Uh, I've always loved e-readers, uh, so I would do these reviews, and they would get a lot of hits, and they would do decent Amazon uh, referral income, so they were great. But then last year, we crossed a tipping point, and there were so many people that started doing similar reviews, and a lot of them were better than mine, especially John's. There were so many people doing similar reviews that I wasn't really adding anything anymore. I realized that, you know, these guys just, they, they covered it. I, I don't need to be there. I, don't, I have nothing more to add. That's, that's fine. And, that's not really a failure. It actually frees me up to do other things. So I, you know, these, these reviews take hours. You know, getting all the photos right and everything, it, it, takes, it takes a long time. So that's not really a failure. That's me being able to move on to do something else. So I've decided with my next app to be okay with the crowded category, but only because I can add something unique and useful to it. So I've decided to replace one of the only third-party apps that I use on my phone more than Instapaper and which will surprise absolutely nobody, I will announce to you guys for the first time ever that, of course, it's a podcast app. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, this like surprises nobody, really. I, I, I'm tired of the stress of, of trying to keep this secret, uh, so I'm going to trade it for the stress of everybody asking me why it isn't done yet. <laughs> it's different. So, why? Podcasts are awesome. See, yeah, somebody listens to podcasts out there. Right? <laughs> They're a great market. They have loyal, passionate fans. They have tons of thriving independent producers. There's no inherent platform lock-in for the technology, and there's a very low barrier to entry for both sides, supply and demand and listening and creating these platforms. Everything is a low barrier to entry in this market. And because of that, they're going through a boom in supply and demand right now. They've been around for like over a decade, but in the last few years, um, people like 5x5 Five Five have come out and really raised the bar and brought a lot of people in. And now you have popular comedians finding out that they can find audiences and podcasts, and then they can go travel around the country and sell shows wherever they go because of their podcast audiences. They don't have to wait around and hope that someday they might get an HBO show. They can just go right now, connect to their fans, build an audience, and be fine. It's a fantastic medium. And it's a very intimate medium. Voice conveys so much more nuance and personality than most text, unless you're a really good writer. Podcast listeners really feel like they're in the same room as the host. They feel like they know you or they're getting to know you. They're also listenable in many common situations where other media is not consumable. Sorry for using consume, I know. There's no better word. Uh, you know, such as driving, long road trips, short errands, uh, walking, walking the dog, walking around, walking to work, uh, during mindless tasks like cleaning or yard work, washing dishes. I listen to podcasts all the time. It's fantastic. They fight boredom. They fight loneliness. They, in, they, just, they entertain you. They inform you. They make you think. And since talking on a podcast is easier and much more casual than writing a blog post, there's a lot of smart people out there who have blogs or who could write somewhere, but they, they say more on podcasts. Wow, that's quite some wind. They, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of smart people who, like, they will, they will say something on a podcast that is either the first draft of a post that might go on their blog later or that's just too long and complicated to ever write about. So if you don't listen to smart people's podcasts, you are missing out on a lot of their work. Now, compared to the media that I came from before, this is a terrible, terrible business. The world of big web publishing, oh, I feel so sorry for anybody who's stuck in it. You have options. It can get better. You don't have to be in that business. Publishers, they just junk up all their pages with all this cruft, and they try to make a few more sense because it's so cutthroat, and CPMs are so terrible, like what Jack said earlier. Um, or they try to entice you to click through a 25-page slideshow, which is never worth it. It's just a scam. It, just look at all the bullshit on this page. Like, actually, 100% of it is bullshit. <laughs> but this, this world is toxic. It's terrible. It's soul-crushing. And this is what Instapaper had to deal with constantly, was taking all this as input and trying to produce something useful out of it, uh, which is not always possible. So I'm totally over this entire industry. I think we as independent people, we can keep reading and writing good stuff ourselves, but the, big, the world of big media, big text, I have want nothing to do with that anymore. It's ridiculous, it's terrible, and it's not because it's inherently evil, well, most of them at least, um, it's because it's, the economics are just so cutthroat. It's, it's awful. So I'm trading this horrible world for this awesome world. This is what big podcasts look like. These are awesome, these are great. This is the world of big podcasting, right? There's no page view scams, there's no clickbait headlines because it's kind of hard to listen to a podcast, so there's not a lot of value in like a clickbait title for a show. Uh, there's no like trashy monetization techniques. In practice, it's so much better than the text business because the constraints of the medium don't allow publishers to really do that many assholeish things to make a little bit more money. They really can't, there's not a whole lot they can really do there. So on a web page, though, that's an entire software platform. They can do whatever they want. So they've found wonderful ways to abuse people and, and annoy us and waste our time and attention. Uh, on podcasts, that's really not possible, so the good ones tend to stay pretty good. This has been, we've had pretty good podcasts for about a decade, and now we just have a lot more of them. So. 
And this is still a much smaller world than the world of text. These you know, top shows in a podcast world might get hundreds of thousands of downloads. We're not talking millions or tens of millions of page views or anything. But people do love it, and sponsors do pay for it. In fact, you'll never get a better CPM than you get on a really good podcast. And you'll never find better fans. You know, nobody ever recognized me at conferences or anything before I had a podcast. No, nobody cared that I worked at Tumblr. Nobody cared that I made Instapaper. The podcast, then people come up to me and say, oh my god, I love your show. These are very different fans. You want these fans. And if you aren't participating in this, you really should join it because it's a very human medium. Nobody in the audience is engaging with your brand. That's, that, they're, they're just humans. They're people. You can be a person. You don't have to annoy people with marketing and robotic spam and all this insincere marketing crap. You can just be a person. It's amazing. Now, I'm also doing this as a bit of a defensive move. Uh, podcasts are not really taking over the world yet, but they might, and they're big enough to attract a few business people and platforms like Stitcher and Libsyn who are trying to capture a little bit too much control for my comfort. Podcasts right now are as powerful and decentralized as blogs were back in their heyday, back like when nobody thought trackbacks or comments could ever go wrong. You know, that's, <laughs> it was very optimistic. You know, it's, <laughs> it made sense at the time. Uh, Podcasts are still in that world where everything's pretty much open and simple and, and, you can, you, and it's pretty positive. There's not a whole lot of abuse going on. So there's no reason why anybody needs to come in with their platform and take over. Screw your platform. I'm going to fight back by making my app be as friendly to independent content creators as possible. All the hits go to your server. All the traffic goes to you as much as possible. Everything's promoting you, the show, and not me, the platform. So bringing this back around to competition. Instapaper was the first thing of its kind. The magazine was the first thing of its kind. But the podcast world is pretty crowded already. I love that top row of icons. <laughs> <laughs> now, and the, the best thing about this is that there's already free juggernauts. There's already Apple with iTunes and their podcast app. There's already Stitcher, which is probably the biggest app that's not Apple's. Uh, so there's already tons of free competition. Apple has already Sherlocked this market in Apple geek terms. Um, you know, and the, the best thing about Apple, though, is that they've been asleep at the wheel for years on podcasts. They don't really seem to care. It's not that big of a part of their business. So they have all this control, but they neglected to lock it down, which is awesome for us and awesome for podcasts. And then there's some independents. Um, there's Instacast, Pocketcast, Downcast, some independent ones that are sold by people like me. They're pretty good. Uh, I don't love them. I, I'm 60% happy with, with most of them at best. Um, but I'm still going to compete with people like me. And they've been building up features for years. But the more I ask around, the more I hear the same thing, that nobody loves their podcast app. So I think there's still room for more entrance here. And marching into this market is the perfect way for me to get over my fears of competition and crowded markets, because it's already very crowded. So I don't need to do this. I could go make some other kind of app that, I don't know, I don't, I don't have any better ideas right now, honestly. But uh, <laughs> I, could, you know, I could keep using Downcast or Instacast forever and always be 60% satisfied. But that's not a very good bar to set. So I, I'm going to try to beat that. I think I've found a unique space, unique features, and a unique take on this. Because John Gruber once referred to Twitter clients as a UI playground. And that's basically a type of app where there's a lot of potential ways you could make a bunch of design decisions. And podcast apps, there's tons of little tiny design decisions you have to make along the way. And I'm picking on them here because the playback screen is by far the hardest thing to design about a podcast app because there's so many competing uh, priorities here and needs. But I'm not really happy with any of these. So uh, I'm taking my own unique take on it. I'm going to be OK with that in the crowded market. And uh, I'm going to add some important new features that no one else has done yet. And maybe they'll beat me to it. And maybe they'll copy it afterwards. And I'm going to have to be OK with that, too. Um, you know, I'm making my favorite app. If it ends up being your favorite, too, that's awesome. Uh, and if not, oh well. Thank you. And this will succeed or fail based only on what I do with it. Not what Apple or Stitcher or SoundCloud or Instacast or Downcast or anyone else does with their apps. So here it is, Overcast. <laughs> and, uh, 
I decided to name it after everyone's favorite weather condition. <laughs> it's about halfway to a 1.0, so uh, it's not really anywhere close to done yet. Uh, and that's the halfway that I've done is the bottom half, like the data and the, <laughs> the back end, so I have nothing else to show for it right now. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to get done by the end of the year. We'll see what happens. That's probably too optimistic. Uh, probably early next year is more uh, realistic. So anyway, my uh, placeholder page went live a few minutes ago automatically because I'm a nerd uh, at Overcast. Uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> at uh, overcast.fm, and uh, you know, I, just to close, I love this medium, this is so good, it, it really enables independent creative people, and it's fulfilling to listen to, it's fulfilling to make. I'm gonna find it immensely satisfying to do anything I can to promote and improve and strengthen this world. Thank you very much.